Book Five, Paragraphs One to Thirteen of On the Latin Language by Varro, read for the LibriVox Language Learning Collection, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Latin Language by Marcus Terentius Varro, Book Five, On the Science of the Origin of Words, addressed to Cicero. In what way names were applied to things in Latin, I have undertaken to expound in six books. Of these, I have already composed three before this one, and have addressed them to Septimius. In them, I treat of the branch of learning which is called etymology. The considerations which might be raised against it, I have put in the first book. Those adduced in its favor, in the second. Those merely describing it, in the third. In the following books, addressed to you, I shall discuss the problem from what things names were applied in Latin, both those which are habitual with the ordinary folk, and those which are found in the poets. Inasmuch as each and every word has two inned features, from what thing, and to what thing the name is applied, therefore, when the question is raised, from what thing pertinacia, obstinacy, is, it is shown to be from pertendere, to persist. To what thing it is applied, is told, when it is explained, that it is pertinacia, obstinacy, in a matter in which there ought not to be persistence, but there is, because it is perseverantia, steadfastness, if a person persists in that in which he ought to hold firm. That former part, where they examine why and whence words are, the Greeks call etymology, that other part they call semantics. Of these two matters I shall speak in the following books, not keeping them apart, but giving less attention to the second. These relations are often rather obscure for the following reasons. Not every word that has been applied still exists, because lapse of time has blotted out some. Not every word that is in use has been applied without inaccuracy of some kind, nor does every word which has been applied correctly remain as it originally was, for many words are disguised by change of the letters. There are some whose origin is not from native words of our own language, Many words indicate one thing now, but formerly meant something else, as is the case with hostis, enemy, for in olden times by this word they meant a foreigner from a country independent of Roman laws, but now they give the name to him whom they then called perduelis, enemy. I shall take as starting point of my discussion that derivative or case form of the words in which the origin can be more clearly seen. It is evident that we ought to operate in this way, because when we say impos, lacking power, in the nominative, it is less clear that it is from potentia, power, than when we say impotem, in the accusative, and it becomes the more obscure if you say pos, having power, rather than impos, for pos seems to mean rather pons, bridge, than potens, powerful. There are few things which lapse of time does not distort. There are many which it removes. Whom you saw beautiful as a boy, him you see unsightly in his old age. The third generation does not see a person such as the first generation saw him. Therefore, those that oblivion has taken away even from our ancestors, the painstaking of Musius and Brutus, though it has pursued the runaways, cannot bring back. As for me, even if I cannot track them down, I shall not be the slower for this, but even for this I shall be the swifter in the chase, if I can. For there is no slight darkness in the wood where these things are to be caught, and there are no trodden paths to the place which we wish to attain, nor do there fail to be obstacles in the paths 
which could hold back the hunter on his way. Now he who has observed in how many ways the changing has taken place in those words, new and old, in which there is any and every manner of variation in popular usage, will find the examination of the origin of the words an easier task, for he will find that words have been changed, as I have shown in the preceding books, essentially on account of two sets of four causes. For the alterations come about by the loss or the addition of single letters, and on account of the transposition or the change of them, and likewise by the lengthening or the shortening of syllables, and their addition or loss. Since I have adequately shown by examples in the preceding books of what sort these phenomena are, I have thought that here I need only set a reminder of that previous discussion. Now I shall set forth the origins of the individual words, of which there are four levels of explanation. The lowest is that to which even the common folk has come. Who does not see the sources of Argentifodinae, silver mines, and of Viacurus, road overseer? The second is that to which old-time grammar has mounted, which shows how the poet has made each word which he has fashioned and derived. Here belongs Pacuvius's, the whistling of the robes. Here his incurvet necked flock. Here his, with his mento, he beshields his arm. The third level is that to which philosophy ascended, and on arrival, began to reveal the nature of those words which are in common use, as, for example, from what opidum, town, was named, and wicus, row of houses, and via, street. The fourth is that where the sanctuary is, and the mysteries of the high priest. If I shall not arrive at full knowledge there, at any rate, I shall cast about for a conjecture which even in matters of our health the physician sometimes does when we are ill. But if I have not reached the highest level, I shall none the less go farther up than the second, because I have studied not only by the lamp of Aristophanes, but also by that of Cleanthes. I have desired to go farther than those who expound only how the words of the poets are made up. For it did not seem meet that I seek the source in the case of the word which Aeneas had made, and neglect that which long before King Latinus had made, in view of the fact that I get pleasure rather than utility from many words of the poets, and more utility than pleasure from the ancient words. And in fact, are not those words mine which have come to me by inheritance from King Romulus, rather than those which were left behind by the poet Livius? Therefore, since words are divided into these three groups, those which are our own, those which are of foreign origin, and those which are obsolete and of forgotten sources, I shall set forth about our own, why they are, about those of foreign origin, whence they are, and as to the obsolete, I shall let them alone, except that, concerning some of them, I shall none the less write what I have found or myself conjecture. In this book, I shall tell about the words denoting places, and those things which are in them. In the following book, I shall tell of the words denoting times, and those things which take place in them. In the third, I shall tell of both these as expressed by the poets. Pythagoras the Samian says that the primal elements of all things are in pair, as finite and infinite. Good and bad, life and death, day and night. Therefore, likewise, there are the two fundamentals, station and motion, each divided into four kinds. What is stationary, or is in motion, is body. Where it is in motion, is place. While it is in motion, is time. What is inherent in the motion, is action. The fourfold division will be clearer in this way. Body is, so to speak, the runner. 
Place is the race course where he runs. Time is the period during which he runs. Action is the running. Therefore, it comes about that for this reason all things in general are divided into four phases, and these universal, because there is never time without there being motion, for even an intermission of motion is time. Nor is there motion where there is not place and body, because the latter is that which is moved, and the former is where. Nor where this motion is, does there fail to be action. Therefore, place and body, time and action, are the four-horse team of the elements. Therefore, because the primal classes of things are four in number, so many are the primal classes of words. From among these, concerning places and those things which are seen in them, I shall put a summary account in this book. But we shall follow them up wherever the kin of the word under discussion is, even if it has driven its roots beyond its own territory. For often the roots of a tree which is close to the line of the property have gone out under the neighbor's cornfield. Wherefore, when I speak of places, I shall not have gone astray, if from ager, field, I pass to an agrarius, agrarian man, and to an agricola, farmer. The partnership of words is one of many members. The wine festival cannot be set on its way without wine, nor can the curia calabra, announcement hall, be opened without the calatio, proclamation. End of the paragraphs 1 to 13 of Book 5 of On the Latin Language by Varro.